7 o'clock. Let's call this meeting to order. All rise for the pledge, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And Nick, call the roll, please. John Leo. Here. John Cox. Here. Mike Turkus. Here. C.C. Johnson. Here. Matt McGarrett. Here. You in the court. Very good. Thank you. Uh, minutes for the open session on January 20th. I didn't see a problem with anything. I read through them and they looked okay to me. Mm -hmm. So, absent any other comments, I'd make a motion to approve. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And then the closed session minutes. I thought they looked great. Yeah. Very I detailed. Would make a motion to approve those. I'll second that. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And then bills. No department. Bills look good. Good on my end. Make a motion to approve. Pay the bills. Pay the bills. I'll second that. And all in favor? Pay the bills. Aye. 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 Okay, uh, citizens comment time. If you have something you'd like to address the council about that's not on the agenda, here we are. Well, I'd be happy to introduce myself, uh, right. which is why I'm here tonight. I'm Stuart Fenton, and I filed today to run for Emmett County Prosecutor. Um, I was the Chief Assistant Prosecutor since 2013, and I've been a prosecutor my entire uh, career for the last 33 years. And so I just wanted to share that with everyone, and you hopefully will all be receiving some literature from me. I have a website, um, uh, stufaprosecutor.com, very simple. Lists all my qualifications for office. I'm very involved in the community. Um, I'm on the board of Habitat for Humanity, Chamber Orchestra, many other organizations. I pick up food for MANA. I play violin here at Bay Bluffs um, with my friend Sally Page. And, we play all over the county for the seniors. Uh, but my passion in life has always been prosecution. I, I've been part of a very successful cold case homicide team in Kalamazoo before I came here. Um, I've tried successfully 30 homicide cases. And um, anything that you will want to know about me is on my website. So uh, you're all involved citizens. I encourage you to check that out, stuforprosecutor.com. You'll hear from me again. Likely you receive literature, like I say. And uh, the election is August 4th. It will be a primary election. And so I hope that I will affirm your vote. Thank you very much. Stuart. Thank you. Anyone else? I just got a few things I want to run by you guys. Um, first of all, in your packet that at our end of the month report, I included about the parking tickets. And we had talked about that, that we sent the letters out. And that hadn't been done in years and years and years. And you'll see it's been very successful. We had outstanding parking tickets over the years that just never got paid. So what we did is we implemented a system, Yvonne and I, and sent reminder letters with our follow-ups, and so we had really good success at that, because it wasn't fair to the people who were paying them. So we uh, we went out, we reached out, and we're following through with Mr. Raymer's support, and it's gone very well. Um, number two is, I, you probably saw the article in the paper on Main and Lake. Um, I'm not with the paper produced the article about the crashes we've had up there. And in the meantime, right after that, I met with them. Dot, um, maybe from them. Dot came over. Actually, the same day the article came out. And so he's looking at that intersection, um, a long-term study. But it, instantly, what he's going to do, and I think they've already marked it. He's going to add another stop sign on the east side of Lake Street. And then, as you're coming out of Merchants Park, there's a stop sign that faces the back side. You'll see the back side. And I believe he's going to add like the cross traffic does not stop sign there. So as you're going sort of, it's supposed to be east, but you're going south looking at the lake, you're going to look at that sign and hopefully he'll put a sign right there that says cross traffic doesn't stop. So that way it'll just bring some awareness. And uh, he's going to continue to monitor that as well. Um, one thing he did talk about, we took it right all the way through town around 119. We looked at the corner of state in Maine in reference to the issues there. And he's going to do a study on that, but his feeling is that they won't make drastic changes without council's approval. Um, which I strongly agree with that. I appreciate that, the fact that he says that back in the old days they'd make the changes and then they'd come and they would tell you what they did and now they ask for your input. So just food for thought, I might be coming with you to you later on that just to try to get your opinion on, you know, we need to change.
changes are leave the same. Everybody has an opinion, so that's that. And then um, over the next week, I'm going to be attending the Chiefs Conference down in Grand Rapids. And we talked about in our budget was the uh, our audio recording for our patrol cars and our body cams. We'll be looking at that. Hopefully, coming back with a cheaper price. That's what I'm hoping. So, undercut mm -hmm. that. Then the final thing, and Victor and I have talked about this, is the marina restrooms. We've had some problems at the marina restrooms lately. Um, actually, I worked midnights a couple nights, both nights I went in there, locked them up. They're getting clogged up. It's, uh, we have, and I know, I'm not saying it's a contractor doing it, but between where the sip and snip used to be, the new condos, and the irises, those restrooms are being used nonstop by the contractors. And somebody is going in there during the day and filling the toilets with paper towel. And then our DPW staff has to go in and clean it up at night. And I work midnights, two nights in a row, it happened to me. Um, Officer Johnson worked the next two nights, it happened to him. So in the meantime, we put, we're put we closing it down, sort of like a probation for a week. We are, we're closing them because I don't feel it's right for our DPW guys to go in there. They're getting abused every day. It's costing money. They, um, they don't smell very well. So we close them all with your support. We're going to close them all this week. We'll open them this weekend for Ice Fest. And then we'll open them on Monday with provisions that hopefully people will behave and it doesn't become a problem. And if it does become a problem, then we might just have to close them down for the remainder of the winter, except for our week. Have so are you, you reached out to the I, I've talked to um, Cottage Company, I've talked to IBS, I've talked to Snip and Slip. So I've talked to all the contractors to say, this is what's going on. You guys manage your people and will allow the restrooms to be used. They have port johns on their sites, right. but in the same sense, it's not heated like our restroom is. So as long as you guys are in support of that, that's what I'd like to do. So I just, it's, it's not fair that the DPW guys should go in there every morning and have to clean that out. We do that. So any comments or concerns? Well, good job. All right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any other citizens comment tonight? No? Good. Turn it over to Victor and the city manager section. Yes, and thank you. So just bear with me. Um, patience a little bit. This is our first go at a new multimedia system, so in case we have a little um, mess ups, just be patient. So. Uh, item A is the after hours electric service reconnection fee uh, resolution. Last meeting, we, uh, the council approved the $250 after hours electric service reconnection fee, but Clerk Whitaker pointed out to me, <coughs> you did, <laughs> yes, you did point out to me that we, um, we need to pass a resolution that's in the code every time you change or increase fees. So um, really what you see attached here is a resolution based on what we agreed to last meeting that um, the city code requires council to establish by resolution fees. City council determined that the $110 administrative fee um, did not um, meet or accurately, accurately reflect the city's costs to reconnect service after hours. And after hours constitutes between um, 4.30 p.m. and 8 a.m. That's the electric lineman's work hours as opposed to, I mean, off duty hours as opposed to the regular um, city hall hours. So, council agreed to raise the fee to $250 more accurately uh, reflect that fee. And then, we just need someone to adopt this resolution. <coughs> you good with everything? Good? All right, I'm good with it, yes. Well, I'll, I'm, I'm, I'm so I'll make a motion that we accept the resolution as presented. Yeah. I'll second that. Roll oh. call. C.C. Johnson. Yes. Mike Viterkis. Yes. John Neal. Yes. John Cobbs. Yep. Matt Kara. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Item B, Peddler's License Fee Resolution. This is going along the same vein as the last one. Um, recently, we received another correspondence from Charter Spectrum Communications that our do not knock registry and Peddler's license is unconstitutional. So right now, I've been calling different municipalities to see if they've been receiving um, any kind of correspondence from Charter. Only one small town in Northern Michigan that I know of received a correspondence and Charter contested their $10 annual fee for a license. And they, I would say, bullied them into negating that $10 fee, annual fee, because they didn't have the resources. I called larger cities downstate that have similar res uh, ordinances and do not knock registry, and they had theirs for seven, eight years and have not got any correspondence from any telecommunication, telecommunications company. So I suspect that it's we are a small 
smaller town, smaller city with less resources, so they're going after uh, these smaller towns with less resources to try to get what they want. We're still looking into it. I've been talking with Mr. Ringer here um, about possible paths going forward. I contacted the MML just to get their interpretation and perspective on it. Um, and then we'll keep you in touch with what's going on with that. But since we want to be doing everything correctly here, I realized we didn't do a resolution for the fee that we established back in August or so. Uh, I think it was back in August. And in that same vein as the previous uh, resolution, we're just establishing that on August 19th, Council adopted Ordinance 421 to regulate door-to-door -door sales and peddling. Um, that chapter requires uh, either a daily or a monthly fee. We went with the monthly administrative fee of $500. And um, Council established that monthly fee as $500. So I just need to know that. Uh, motion to approve this resolution. I'll make a motion to approve. I'll second. John Cups. Yep. John Leo. Yes. Mike Turkus. Yep. C.C. Johnson. Yes. And Matt Mugera. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. All right. For the highlight of the, the <laughs> uh, the geese species mitigation presentation and recommendations. In autumn of 2019, um, council instructed staff to investigate potential solutions to the geese species problem on public property near the waterfront. This was after Mr. O'Brien um, came to both the Harbor Commission and the Council to inform us of the problem and ask us to do something about it. And it was great, thank you for coming, that really inspired and kicked off this whole, this whole discussion. Um, so I spent significant time researching and analyzing the potential solutions and I prepared this following report. Um, we are ultimately recommending a multi-pronged solution which includes the purchase of a motor power DC sweeper uh, sight and sound scare devices, increased manual sweepings and rakings on the docks and on the beach, and as well as a public outreach education campaign to encourage people not to feed the wildlife. Um, so basically, I, I'll, I'll, you've all read this, so I'll, I'll browse through it really quickly here. Um, the survey that we did, we had uh, 171 responses uh, in the fall. 80% um, said there was a goose related problem. 88% said the feces were the problems, uh, was the main problem. Um, the three biggest areas were the marina, green space, Zorn Park Beach and Grass, and the docks. And 52% of respondents said they avoided using public spaces because of the geese presence or the geese species. Um, There's a variety of opinions on how to solve and mitigate um, the problems based on those um, salute, those recommendations and what other cities were doing, municipalities. I uh, began my research that way. In general, this might be overkill, but there's three philosophies for geese removal or geese species um, mitigation. One is changing the environmental conditions, such as the habitat. The other is removing the geese. And the third is um, cleaning up after geese. Um, so they each come with their ups, pros, and cons. As you imagine, removing the geese is a little more controversial on the ethical side. Changing the habitat can be more costly and also create some aesthetic and um, visual impacts or use issues so and cleaning up after the geese solves the problem of the geese species only for when you clean it up the geese are still there still doing their business so i created a little uh, chart here of the different types of methods um, and you can see just you know the red signifies not a good solution for harbor springs green signifies i think what i think is a good solution and yellow signifies a, a decent a potential solution um, Reducing lawn space, not a good idea because um, that leaves less green space for the public and it's incompatible with the city's master plan. Letting the grass grow tall, again, is not user friendly and can attract pests. The feces sweeper is directly tackles the problem of removing feces as a low maintenance cost, but it's weather dependent. So, you know, if it's wet, the grass is wet, you can't use it as effectively. But if the grass is dry, then yes, you can use it really well. Uh, plant fescue grass, which is the grass that geese dislike, but then Greek geese will eat that grass if no other grass is nearby. And replacing entire grass can be costly. Treat grass with repellents. Geese will eventually seek other food sources. However, there's potential environmental concerns. And even if it's biodegradable and, and organic and safe for humans, there's still the perception of pouring chemicals near our water. Um, 
education outreach, I talked about it a little bit, that's low cost and it helps inform people about not being geese, but we really can't really reach everyone, especially in a town like us where most people in the summer are visitors and resorters. It's hard to reach them through an educational campaign. A plant natural hedge along the shoreline. Uh, Petoskey did something like this, and it be it's beneficial because geese suspect that the predators are on the other side, so they're afraid to cross over the hedge, um, and it's a natural solution with no harmful effects. However, it limits the human use of the green space can be costly to install and it requires staff maintenance. Planting tree stands along the shoreline, geese can't fly through the tree stands, but again, that'll completely limit the use of the green space and it will block views, which um, is not allowed in the waterfront. You're not allowed to plant trees to block views. Um, trained goose herding dogs. This is a, a potential solution. Um, trained dogs are very good at scaring the geese away. Um, border collies especially mimic the behavior of wolves. Um, there are not many options in northern Michigan. Um, you'd likely have to contract with someone that's at least two hours away, um, which adds to the cost, and it's a, something you have to do every year, um, a, during a certain period of the year. Mr. O'Brien called me, uh, I think a few days ago, and talked about the possibility of having a, a town dog um, in the future if these solutions don't work out, which I don't think necessarily is a bad idea, but the logistics of figuring out who would keep the dog, who would feed the dog, and, those things we'd have to figure out. So, But overall, I, I don't think goose herding dogs is a bad idea. It's potential. We have potential for it. But there's a more of a longer term spread out cost for it. Light emitting devices are inexpensive. Same thing with um, annoying sound devices. Uh, but though those are hit or miss. I mean, some have really terrible reviews. Some have good reviews. Sometimes the geese get used to them. Sometimes they don't. It usually depends on the individual goose. Animal decoys are also inexpensive, but geese get used to them pretty quickly. So that's a potential solution, but they look tacky, so I didn't want to suggest that right away. <coughs> then there's three ones that really, you know, are focused on getting rid of the geese, are egg nest destruction, capture and relocating the geese, and the goose hunts. Um, they can reduce the population, at least for the season. However, these are controversial. Um, staff, for the nest, staff have not spotted any nests on public property. So there's nothing we probably be able to do with that anyway. For capture and relocate, more than half of the relocated geese usually find their way back. And goose hunts are you know, potentially dangerous as well as controversial and ethical as all other ones are. There's some ethical issues there with hunting geese on uh, city land and removing tampering with nests and capture and re re relocating them. So I think it's safer to stay away from those routes. And finally, there's electric fence. Again, I think that would limit the use of the green space. Um, plant from palatable ground cover, um, again, that would limit the use of a green space. And geese hazing by people, that's really just people chasing geese around, <laughs> which I think it's, it's cheap and it would, it, it would work, but who wants to staff that? <laughs> Liability issues too, but if someone hurts their back or something, I guess hit by a geese on me. So. Anyway, so when I came up to my recommendation for what I did, I considered the costs staff time, how the solutions would impact public use, environmental impacts, how the geese are affected, aesthetic impacts. So my first main solution is to get a purchase and utilize a geese feces sweeper. Um, there's actually two different types. One uh, specifically focuses on manure from horses and geese. Another is sweeps things off the grass in general. Um, I discussed this with City of Novi, who said they've tried everything and that um, everything they've done has not worked, but this sweeper keeps their parks clean on a consistent basis, so it doesn't let the feces accumulate. Um, DPW Director Lucas investigated, did his own research, and called different companies, called different municipalities and entities, and brought back a couple um, models that he thought would work for us. Um, the benefits of using this are the city does not have several acres of waterfront lawn, so it won't take several hours or days to you know, sweep up the grass just a couple of, just a couple of hours. Um, the machine could cost could last between ten and twenty years, even longer. Um, it's low maintenance and reoccurring costs. It's a modest one-time investment. Staff has flexibility in when and how to implement or control its operation. It directly attacks the problem, which is feces. It does not require modification to our parks, shoreline, or grassy areas. There's no aesthetic concerns, and no ethical concerns. The drawbacks are as effectiveness is limited when the ground is wet. It's an additional responsibility for DPW. Geese will still defecate 
and it doesn't work well on docs, but it could possibly work well on docs. Really, the problem with on docs is that our DPW vehicles, it's hard for them to back out once they've already gone forward. So you'd have to back out a dock without falling off the dock, which, which could pose a problem. Um, so I think the benefits outweigh the draw, the drawbacks. Um, I think that there are, um, we that we should try this for a, a, a few years, a few summers. Um, different summers have different conditions. Some summers might be wet, so we might not get as much sweeping. Some summers might be really dry, where we can get more sweeping in during the week. Um, the varieties, I'll show you in a little bit. There's a tow and collect. I said it's designed specifically for animal feces, horse and geese. The sweep ball is designed to sweep a much broader range of items, such as leaves and trash. It could be potentially be used on pavement. The tow and collect 60 inch has a detacher, which will break up the feces to make it easier, but the sweep ball, you can order one for same, just, a, just a, I guess like $100 extra or something like that. So it's really not that expensive to get a detacher for that. They're both motorized at this, at the 60 inch level. Um, and the bag and compartments are slightly different. Um, just different <coughs> shapes. One's a bag, one's like a compartment box. Not really big differences. Um, the reason I like the sweep ball, and so does the DPW director, is because you can use it for other things like trash and leaves. So when we have events, when we have you know, doing leaf pickup or anything like that on public property, it's more. It's going to be more than just a, a, a poop scooper. So I didn't say that in a detail. The other, like I said, the other second uh, solution is to have a more consistent and frequent sweeping and raking schedule at the docks and the beaches. That's um, having the lifeguards as well as the marine, uh, harbor master staff sweep and rake more regularly. Um, the third prong is to purchase and install sight or sound devices that aren't distracting the humans. Some can be as cheap as $10, $20. Others can be expensive as $500. I suggest we buy a few, locate them, and, re and adjust them accordingly and see how those work. It wouldn't be a large <coughs> investment. And then, of course, there's an educational campaign for not paying the fees. Um, that's my recommendation. Here's the actual visuals. This is the tow and collect, what you see. That's the 48 inch. And that's the, this is the motorized 60 inch. And then there's a sweep ball, which has, which Lucas kind of likes the, the compartment bag better, um, easier to, to operate. You just put that on some sort of you know, smaller vehicle that you can get as the you know, buggy or something, tow it around. And so then, yeah, these are just the survey responses. So I recommend this one right here um, as a purchase. Great information. Yeah, very, very detailed. And this sounds like a good flexible tool. Like you said, you can also pick up trash. Yeah. And it can be towed by just about anything. Yeah. And the feces that we collect would be dumped at the compost pile at Columbus Park. Yeah, I would, I would take a recommendation to follow this, the first outline in my report. Does anyone have any additional? Now, put you on the spot. <laughs> well, the only comment I would want to make is, uh, you know, the, the residents of the city came forward and said there's a problem, and the city responded meaningfully, quickly, thoroughly, professionally. It's really appreciated. Thank you. It really means a lot. Well, I'll make a motion to approve the sweep ball as he's presented it. Second that. Yeah. In favor of the sweep off? Aye. 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 Nice, nice job. All the information is in Vega. And uh, as far as the human resources, when Stu becomes prosecutor, I can uh, send all his people over here to uh, work the beach for us. He's very thorough. <laughs> That's that survey, so All right, I'll move on to item D, which is the West 3rd Street project alteration. So at the last council meeting, uh, staff notified um, council that we would be pushing back our Bay Street infrastructure project to two, 2021 because of the high water levels, and we would be doing the infrastructure, the West 3rd Street infrastructure project um, to 2020. We, we wanted to plan on doing it in the fall, however, um, uh, Joe Neal Benchmark recommended we do in the spring because um, the finished work 
is done toward the end, done toward the end of the project when weather conditions are better. Longer daylight hours also a significant factor. Um, fall projects tend to finish up when weather is cold and dark. The days are short, which means the seeding quite often is unsuccessful and requires additional work the following spring. So there's, based on his recommendation, we should do it on, on this, in the spring, and Lucas concurred with that. Um, so when we went to go talk to uh, Benchmark about providing plans for us, um, at that time, Lucas, um, DPW director, and based on his opinion and Kyle, Chief Knight's opinion about potentially how potentially widening the West 3rd Street could mirror the effects that we saw on East 3rd Street by improving um, traffic flow and safety concerns. He asked uh, Joe and Neil at Benchmark to provide alternate um, renderings of what it would look like um, and cost to extend the, the street. Um, during the course of planning, um, sorry, I skipped already did that part. Uh, Mr. Neal is recommending what we widen the north side as opposed to the south side because the infrastructure on the south side, such as city electrical lines, et cetera, would increase, significantly increase um, the cost of the project. Um, and one third of the curve on the north side is already scheduled to be replaced during the construction of new water services, so it makes more sense to do the north side if we are going to do it any, any side. In our capital improvements plan, we estimated that the project would cost about $200,000. Um, you see there how much it would cost without the widening and with the widening. Relatively, $12,000 is, is a relatively small increase. Um, we could still come under your budget depending on what the contractors, of course, the bids come back as, but um, with the contingencies, we're expecting $215,000 with um, widening it versus $203,000 or $204,000 without widening it. If we were to complete the project before the start of summer, we need to get to bid as soon as possible. On Thursday, as soon as I received the information from our engineer, they immediately sent out letters, and Mr. Potter sent out letters to um, residents on West 3rd Street and property owners on West 3rd Street to let them know that today, council would be deciding on when we put out when we put out this project to bid, that we're bidding for the higher, higher number. This is, I, I don't see this as a meeting where we're deciding to widen the street or not, but we put it out, we put it out to bid to widen so we know that we, um, what the highest expense could be. And then if we come back in March when we get their bids to select a contractor, then we can decide whether we want to go with the widening or not. That way it'll give the residents more opportunity to, to look at the plans, to ask questions, understand the impacts. Um, and so the schedule, I believe then, um, would be looking at an April, first week of the April start for construction, done by early June sometime, um, give or take a couple of weeks, depending on the weather, of course, and the contractor. Um, we would, of course, have another a pre-construction meeting in late March to let the residents know exactly when construction will start and um, any, address any concerns they have about the actual construction. Um, so this is, again, the, the timeline that we're proposing, um, the costs break down in the sheets there. And then I do have the actual construction sheets, if you can see them here. This is um, West 3rd Street. This is what it would look like without the widening. And that green line you see there is where the curb currently is. And then if you go to, if I go to the next page, this will show where the new curb line. So it kind of goes up just runs through the trees a little bit now. That's the base of the trees. So it's really, it, and there's difference. So right now, West 3rd Street is not the same width on all different spots. So some spots are wider and some spots are not as wide. So that's why we have a range of widening between one and two feet. So we get in different spots of West 3rd Street. So we get it all even width. And this width will be roughly similar to the width give or take a couple inches on East 3rd Street. And it is the section between State and Church. State, oh sorry, State no, and Travers. And oh, so, so it's all the way to Travers. Yeah, yes. so there's there's another okay. sheet from Church to Travers. Well, that's right. Okay, yeah. there it is. Just wanted to be sure. And we got a couple uh, comments, but one from the tr Mark Gilbert of the Tree Board, just um, if through this course of the construction, he's, he's recommending that if the trees are damaged or die within a year or two, that the city can place the trees with money that we don't already have allocated for trees. And what I think is a reasonable um, 
years ago. But if they die in eight years from now, I don't think that's a, you can't tie that in necessarily to the project, but they die within a year or two. And I said that's reasonable. I did get a, another call from a lady on the phone and we talked a little bit about that as well. And she, I don't know if she's here today. She is. <laughs> The recommendation then would be to um, allow well, city to put it out to bid this week for the, with the widening. I'm contingent on the fact that it's not we're not approving the widening, we're just approving the bid to put it out to bid for widening. And then, if for some reason at the next council when we come back to council with this, the council decides not to go with the widening, all they have to do is put in a change order and just you know take that out of their their budget items and go back to those. So the companies you would be putting this to bid to understand that it could be yep. either one. Yep. So the widening only goes to Traverse Street? Yep, between State and Traverse, yes. Okay, thank you. Well, I would make a motion to approve. Questions? I just was going to follow up with Victor's comment that we all sat here when we widened the other section and there was pros and cons to that. The majority of it was the cons, but then those same people came back and appreciated the fact that it was wider. And I did a study back the last 10 years, and we've had a fair amount of crashes. We have six, what they call side swipe, whether they're the same or opposite. And if I drive that street all the time, you'll notice a lot of mirrors folded in because the majority, we had a lot of crashes on that that aren't reported because of mirrors hitting each other right. as they're going along. So those six, plus I think it would help the intersection of third, even though it might not be wider there, it just it frees it up and makes it a little bit at third and eight, which is a high action area for us as well. So right. I think it's a great idea. I know that there's pros and cons, but I think it's a good idea. Yeah, I agree. Well, a lot of construction trucks use that versus Main Street. Correct, because it's a straight through instead of taking a curve and backtracking. Yep. So, I'll second the motion. Is this where we talk? Yeah. yeah. Okay. <coughs> Hi, my name is Louise Finkelstein. I have a house on 164 West Third. Looks like I'm going to lose two trees. But I have a, I have some points I just want to bring up to the board. And I know, yes, move forward, get a quote with or without widening. I'm just very concerned that this board is very comfortable with the fact that, well, once you get the bid for widening, we're moving forward. I, I just, I just get that feeling. I'm very nervous, Joe O'Neill from Benchmark on the April 15th City Council meeting when we were discussing the East Third. His comment at that time stated that Third Street should be widened to match West section, including East Third Street is currently too narrow. West wasn't put out there to be widened at that time in April. So what happened, my question to the board is from April 15, 2019, when Benchmark Engineering said, West Street was fine to now we should get a quote to widen it. So I, just as a board, I think you should discuss that. I think it was the west end of East 3rd Street, which had been done the previous year. Correct. By the Legion. And by the Legion, and his thoughts were to make all of East 3rd Street the same width. So it didn't, wasn't truly west. Okay. And then how many traffic accidents like two years ago versus last summer were on West Third? I don't have the breakdown year by year. I went back to the last ten years and researched it. I can get both. I mean one year to the next year to see no, in, in regards to the narrowness. East third oh the East Third Street? Yeah. No, West Third. Oh West Third? Versus East Third. Oh okay. So I think you should consider that. Right. If East Third is busier and so it had more narrowing issues versus West Street that isn't as busy, then that's another reason to not take away the history, the narrowness, the quaintness of what Harbor Springs is, just so it's symmetrical. I don't think being symmetrical right. should be a reason to do it. Because you're taking what we all love about Harbor away. Safety, totally get it. But I haven't seen anything presented yet, and I did do a Freedom of Information Act with the Police Department today takes seven days to compare what we see. And I think as a city council responsible to do that for us, because we voted you in, you should consider that. I don't like the loss of green space if it doesn't have to be done. But I do appreciate the fact, although short, <laughs> 
that we did get letters on the 31st, but we had to be here on the 3rd. It always seems this process happens not in the summer, not when the summer people are here to give their voice to, and, it, and it, not during the holidays. I mean, Benchmark wasn't out here January 29th doing the measurements. They were out here last summer. I know this because I saw them twice in front of my third street house. When I asked them what they were doing, they were like, oh, a neighbor down there wants us a survey on their property. Well, that wasn't what they were doing. The city asked for the survey. So, I, you know, that all rubs you the wrong way when you're a taxpayer and you kind of feel deja vu. Here we are getting somewhat blindsided, but I do appreciate the fact that we're allowed to come here and give you, obviously, moving forward, if you get both quotes, we will do this again with our, and hopefully by then, the council, I will research what is the true fact of accidents because of the narrowness. Narrow I mean, I have a friend who drives Eckenhart, Eckenhart semi-truck for 20 years here, was shocked that the city thought West 3rd had to be narrow. Go down there all the time with an 18-wheeler, never had a problem. In the summer? Yep. So. Definitely. And he probably has 10 cars backed up the other way waiting for him to but go that's through. Not a re that's not an accident you can't, issue. I mean, things no, it's happen not a, on Well, it can be. It's, back, it's a congestion problem when cars have to well, wait, I'll whether it's him. on State Street or back. I'll ask him. So, well, I, I, I drive big trucks. I can tell you that's so kind of how it works. <laughs> they have point both. Because so, he drives trucks also. I mean, emergency trucks, we have to stop and wait. You know, and for then cars if you to don't get out of our way. Winding, if you save money by not doing the winding, you can use it for your cooper scooper. <laughs> <laughs> so that's another plus. You don't have to dip into the well again. So that's all I have to say, and I thank you. Thank you. Yes. How much wider generally is the proposal? Uh, it's Over. about one and a half feet, but it's between one and two feet, um, depending on the spot of um, West Third Street. But on average, it's about one and a half. That was about like it was on East Yes. Okay. 18 inches, I think. 18 yeah. inches was the average mm -hmm. on the one that just similar. But there's areas closer to State Street, I think, where it's narrower, which is when you first turn. Um, and then it gets a little bit, I think, wider down the other, towards the church, between Travers. It gets wider down that way. And I just want to emphasize again, we sent out that letter as soon as we got our information from yep. Benchmark, and we only found out in late January that we were going to do this project this year because it was slated for next year. So, and yeah. you're simply asking for approval to go and get the bids, right. and your schedule included hearings, additional opportunities to provide bids. Yes. March. Right. When we come in March, council the first 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 March council meeting in March. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. so there'll be more opportunity to discuss this. I just wanted people to know. Yeah. Yeah, we're working on it, boy. We've got three quarters done this. this lady. Yeah. So I have an open motion by John Leo, seconded by Cups, to allow staff to go forward with the bid process. All in favor? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right, this um, renewable energy goals discussion. Um, so the city now sits on the Accelerated Renewable Energy Supply Service Committee in the MPPA, or Michigan Public Power Agency. The other two members are Petoskey and Traverse City. The purpose of this committee is to bring more of a focus to the growing the renewable energy supply component of our, um, our supply, our energy supply that we purchase. Um, the state currently requires that municipalities must generate 15% of their um, energy or electricity from renewable energy. Uh, Petoskey and Traverse City have loftier goals. There's, there's, they're both aiming for 100%. Petoskey by two, 2035 and um, Traverse City by 2040. So um, we're at just about 15%, above 15% where we stand. Um, so I think I want to, I'd like the council to explore whether or not we should establish some short-term or long-term renewable energy goals. Um, the city is inter interested in establishing such goals. I'll work with staff and MPPA to um, get a path and set goals that are uh, viable and reasonable. I think there's a lot of good reasons to go 
forward with renewable energy from diversification to the cleaner environment, and that's is becoming more cost effective. At the same time, we also need to be smart and well reasoned and make sure we don't um, get put all our eggs in one basket, that we have a well reasoned approach that um, we're not raising the costs of our users um, to buy that electricity, we're not raising costs too much. So there's a lot of different factors we have to look into, but I think there's a, a trend moving toward this direction, and um, the and the renewable energies are definitely more cost effective. They're, they're, and, and 10 years from now, they're going to be more cost effective. And so there's a lot of different reasons to go forward with that. Um, I think Potosky's and Traverse City's goals are really lofty. I'm not saying they're impossible, but they're just they're really lofty goals. I don't know if that's feasible for Harbor Springs at this point, but we have to look at um, what we can do. So I guess really just I'm asking for counsel whether or not this is something you are interested in. And if it is, then I will go forward working with staff and MPPA to throw out some numbers and, and a way to get to those numbers. And it could be something like 2030 or 2040, whatever year you want, but I'll just get some feedback from you guys on that. I think it's something we should pursue. The industry is headed this way. We should be on the front end of it, not on the back end of it. Now, these other two cities, are they working together at all? Would, so, there, would there be synergism in all three? That's the whole idea of sitting on this Accelerated Renewable right. Energy Committee is to get those cities and municipalities that are interested in is to brainstorm ideas. Right. Whether it's ideas for um, renewable energy projects, whether it's a solar project or, or a hydro project, it, 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 it's ideas to get everyone at the table that's interested in it. So in that way, they are working together. I don't know on beyond that if they're working together beyond that. But as far I'm as just working is, cooperatively yeah. to understand what the options are and if it actually benefits us if they have more aggressive goals and we're researching it, we can benefit from their aggressive posture. So I, I'm yeah, very much in favor of piggyback on there. Absolutely. Absolutely. So you're, you're taking three organizations to do the investigation rather than one, so I'm in favor. And the MPPA is a good resource to have. Yeah. Okay. And then based on what you find out, that decision is I was going to try to put out a number, they're not understanding more what we're talking about. Uh, as this evolves, maybe it does make sense. 100% is an aggressive goal, regardless of the time frame. Just, this is going to, there's a lot happening and a lot of investment going this way, but who knows what the time frame is, so I wouldn't know where to put the, put the needle. Yeah, but as you come back and report, we might come up with it. Working with them, you might come back and propose to them. That, that, that is the idea, yeah. 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 I think we definitely can be and should be above the state minimum of 15% by 2021. And we do have, so far, almost 40 people signed up for a BGP, voluntary repricing. So there is interest. Um, okay. We have uh, Rick, Rick Evans of Groundwork who's going to come to our sewer authority meeting in February to talk about the possibility of using some of that sewer authority land for a uh, solar project. So there's, there's a lot of different moving parts here, moving pieces, but um, um, there is definitely an interest, a growing interest in trying toward this direction, so. All right. Yeah, we don't need to vote on that, right? as long as there's no opposition. Okay. All right, item F is uh, an emergency power equipment contract approval. Um, 2016, the city contracted with ASCO Power Services to maintain some of our emergency power equipment. Located, out through, located throughout the city. Um, these, this maintenance covers uh, our computers that control peak shading, which, is, which reduces the amount of electricity we purchase during our peak use hours. And, it trans and it's our transfer switches, which in case of a citywide electrical outage, it automatically switches our system to a diesel power generator that keeps electricity flowing to select sites, city hall, police department, uh, fire, uh, schools, as, um, to be used as emergency shelters. So that's the key there, is it automatically switches over. Without this system, we'd have to go switch it over manually, which who knows how long, how long that could take in an emergency situation. We wouldn't want that. We currently contract with ASCO on an annual basis for regular maintenance of some of our parts. After some of our parts failed due to a lack of regular maintenance, which resulted in several thousand dollars, I don't know the exact number, um, but there's some parts that we had to replace a few years ago. Since then, the city has kind of been budget budgeting about $15,000 annually uh, for this regular maintenance of our emergency power equipment and any needed repairs. Um, this new contract with ASCO 
which is they're the only viable option for providing this service for our equipment. We'll commit us to a five-year maintenance agreement with them, which will give us better rates in comparison to a year-to-year -year agreement, about almost 7% savings. There are two packages, preferred maintenance and essential maintenance. The main differences between the two are cost. The preferred package is about $5,000 more expensive each year for a total cost of $65,591, which is about $24,500 more than the essential package, $41,000, um, $41,116.95. And then the other difference is the corrective measures. Any parts that need to be replaced or fixed come with the preferred package, so that's included. Uh, with the essential package, labor and parts are 53% off. So we have historically gone with the central package and budgeted extra money just in case um, we need to pay for parts or labor. We might not necessarily need to replace parts every year or at all during the five-year agreement, which is why I'm recommending we continue with the central maintenance package. If we need to replace some parts over the course of five years, that cost will likely not be greater than the $25,000 we are saving by going with the central maintenance package, but there is a chance. Um, even if the cost is greater than $25,000, we're still saving money by preventing more costly failures in the future. Just really an assurance. Um, are we going to go with the gold standard or silver standard insurance? I, I you know, really go with silver. I don't see a need to go with the gold standard. As long as we're doing regular maintenance, there shouldn't be major problems. Um, so I'm, I'm asking, I'm recommending council authorize me to sign a five year maintenance agreement for about $8,000 a year at $41,116.95. I'm curious about the, the fact that this is the only viable option. For yeah, so they're the service. only one. So the parts that we have, so the computer and the transfer switch, though they are the ones who specialize in those parts. Um, yeah. So. Okay. Is that something to be looked at? I mean, Lucas, yeah, Lucas looked at this several. There's, it's it's one of those things, kind of like um, when we're when we're going for the the, the kumbatsu. Um, the Komatsu, yeah, yeah loader. That's you can't use any other brands' parts on that. This is this is something similar. They're oh. they they the parts. If it, they have the parts, they'll replace the parts. With their parts. So if the computer goes bad, and I don't know if Nick has a better understanding, but that's what I understood. Minimal. Yeah. Um, I did question the same thing. That why are we captive audience to one company? Right. Um, my understanding is that <coughs> we would have to replace the whole. Design whole system with another company that potentially that would hold us just as captive as Aspen. At the time this was designed, they were one of the only operations that would come to this area and do this kind of stuff. So that's how we ended up with Aspen. I assumed you had an answer. I was curious. Next answer was Anytime you're sole source, you, you got to worry. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's, and this is, you know, I always, Lucas is really thorough about checking in with competitors. So, um, he wouldn't say we're captive unless we really are captive. So. And this was in the budget? Yep. We we budget fifteen thousand dollars a year. Not specifically for this contract, but this contract has been in the budget under line item and not. So it's covered in the budget. Correct, yes. Because we've done it for years past. Do you need a motion? Yes. Does I have to make a motion to approve? I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Yes. Hey, one question real yep. quick. So we just went through and replaced that part on the machine at the fire station. Did they go through and happen to look at the other two machines and see if those parts were faulty as well? I think. I think that was a cat that did that. Yeah, that, that was, was a cat. generator. Oh, in that. This is the system that computer system that would switch if the power went out. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And I, I don't know if they did the other two. I can get back to that. I was curious. Yeah. That makes sense. All right, next item, final item, is the meter reading vehicle and half ton purchase approval. In the 2020 capital improvement plan and budget, we budgeted for a meter reading vehicle and a half ton pickup for the public works. Estimated that each vehicle would cost about $29,000. Uh, Lucas and DPW got several different quotes of several different types of um, trucks. The Ram came in at the lowest price you see there at $26,500 um, from Brown Motors, $27,000 from um, My Deal. Um, but 
Lucas is recommending we take the, the F-150 because compared to the Ram, F-150 has a better payload, better fuel, he sounds like a salesperson for Ford, <laughs> a better payload, better fuel economy, and more towing capacity. The Ram would be a 2018 model, and the newer model doesn't offer a regular cab pickup. The higher Chevy and GMC prices are due to steel body, while the F-150 has an aluminum body. Uh, Lucas said the city has had great performance out of the previously purchased Ford vehicles. None of any signs of rust, corrosion, or mechanical issues. There are two options for the F-150, one from Brown Motors at 29,000, 198, and one's from Bideal, which is $28,897. Um, we may choose a, the higher price item based on a purchase policy if the vendor is located within city limits or within Emma County and as not more than great, their costs, their price is not more than 5% greater than the lowest quote. In this case, Brown Motors is located in the county. F-150 they're selling is $301 more expensive, which is about a 1% difference. Our policy allows for a 5% difference. And my deal, F-150 dealer is located in Metro Detroit. So it's much more, it's much further away. So I recommend that we purchase the two F-150 vehicles uh, from Brown Motors for the cost of $29,198.28 28 per each vehicle. This comes at just a, just a tad bit over what we estimated the cost in the budget at $29,000. Yeah, makes sense. Okay. I make a motion that we purchase the two F-150s from Brown Motors. Second. John Leo. Yes. T.C. Johnston. Yes. Mike Naturkus. Yes. John Cops. Yes. Matt here. Yes. Motion carry. Thank you. Yes. Uh, city's manager's report. Um, not a whole too much to add on, but um, the system software updates for our, our um, online payments and credit card payment system will be hopefully coming at the end of February. Is when they do that software updates, and then we'll transition over in March to those online payments and credit card payments. Mm -hmm. So hopefully by spring, we'll have that working, but I'm not gonna hold us to the exact thing because things always happen. <laughs> um, the Pennsylvania Avenue project is currently out for bid. The new technology is here, you see it mm -hmm. for you. Um, Rick Evans Groundwork Center is gonna be going to the HS ASDA to discuss solar project there and potential solar project. Um, 911 was down early Friday morning. Um, that was statewide. It's not just Harbor Springs. It was due to a system update that went on. So some of you who are signed up for emergency alerts on your phone, like I was, got text messages at 4 a.m. saying 911 mm. was down. So um, it was down just for a few hours. But it's scary that it was statewide. Yeah. Ah. Wow. My understanding Oops. So that's really all I uh, have. Um, Working on a uh, re renegotiating a, a lease for the parking lot behind the Methodist Church. Um, we've maintained that since 1994. Um, well, sorry, we've used that as a public lot in the summer months since 1994. And what the church got out of it is was we, we paid it. We, well, we brought it level and we made it a nice parking lot. Um, as opposed to this falling apart. So now, the parking lot is getting a little more shape and. The lease technically expired in 2014, so we're talking about potentially making this a, a full year public parking lot and then um, doing some more work there. So we'll come back to you when we have a hearing about that. So, and that's all I have. Um, boards. Yeah, boards and commissions. I've got a bunch of people that are re-upping. Uh, on the Harbor Commission, uh, Laura Kors and Tom Graham, who have been members for quite some time, have volunteered to stay on. So there's no opposition to that. We'll keep Tom and Laura. Uh, Richard, or Dick Babcock, is going to stay on the Board of Commissions as an alternate. Uh, George Kilborn, who's been on it for quite some time, is resigning. It's got too much for him, so we'll be, I'll be looking for a new replacement for him. Uh, the Zoning Board of Appeals, Kristen McDonald, who is the chairperson, has volunteered to stay on for another three-year term, so she's still good.
That is the most fun board. It is the most fun board. <laughs> More fun than the sewer? More fun than the sewer. Okay, put that in the newspaper for us. <laughs> <laughs> in bold. At least board reviews only twice a year. That's true. It's the shortest board. Um, doing old business? Nothing for me. Uh, well, yes, Anything? Only I yeah. wish they'd put the mirror up at the bottom of uh, Judd Hill. I just sent that to Lucas. To, to, he's he's going to be working on that. Yeah. Oh, I know. Whatever happened to the street light stuff that Rachel's working on forever? All the street lights, all the changing all the bulbs and all of that. Is that still? Oh, that's still coming that's still out? coming up after Ice Fest, right, Mark? That's, that's our next task. <laughs> I didn't want to get jumped too far ahead, but. <laughs> no, that's still on DDA's list of things. Does that work? Just a reminder that the Ice Fest is this weekend. Yes. Well, Margo's working well. very hard, the community's working very hard, so should be good enough. Sure. Ice carving some chili. Speaking of events, I forgot to say our kickoff of the campaign is right here at Harbor Springs at the pier, 335 on February 29th, New Pier Saturday. You're all invited. Yeah, very good. Did you say open bar name? I heard you. All right. Well, if there's no other business, I'll adjourn the meeting. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.